Well, the first time I actively practiced science was at MBL. Uh, my uncle, Philip Dunham, who was a professor at Syracuse University, and Jerry Weissman, who was a professor at NYU, for about a decade uh, rented a laboratory and collaborated together here in the summer. And so I came up here first in the summer of 1982 to function as the dishwasher. They needed someone to wash the dishes. Their laboratory, Whitman 206, now a uh, row 206. And that was the first time I really saw science in action, which you don't ever get to see. Um, no matter how great a school you go to in a K through 12 system, you don't really see science in action. And so that was the first glimpse of what I knew I wanted to be. In, uh, in row 206. Well, I came back, so I, I, worked, um, I worked in that laboratory, graduating from dishwasher to actually doing the experiments, being a technician in 1982, 1983, and 1984. So that transition between uh, the end of high school and the first year of college. And so by then, an MBL provides the best possible introduction to science because people participate. Uh, you can see uh, kids as young as uh, 15 participating in some way mm -hmm. uh, through um, college students, through high school students, uh, graduate students, postdocs, and then when I was here, Albert St. Georgie was still alive, so you would see many, many generations of, of humans um, actively practicing science at all levels mm -hmm. in the most beautiful possible environments. So I thought, this is the life. You know, you can be active and intellectually engaged uh, from 15 to 100. So that, that's what hooked me. So when I was here in the 80s, we studied what, what Phil and Jerry were interested in, which was using marine uh, cells from sponges to study cell-cell interactions. And so that got me thinking about cells. And so then when I went, um, to college at Columbia in New York City. I, I continued thinking about cells and organelles, but then when I went to graduate school, I moved up from individual cells to the behavior of multicellular organisms. And so in graduate school at Rockefeller University, I worked with Mike Young. And Mike has done some of the really important work on what governs sleep patterns and rest activity patterns in flies. So I sort of switched from marine sponge cells to the behavior and the behavioral genetics of, of sleep and circadian rhythms in the fly. What I do today is, is a continuation of what I did as a postdoctoral fellow. I did my postdoc with Richard Axel at Columbia University. And Richard um, is, uh, was at the time and is still today obsessed with smell and how genes and circuits govern how we smell things and how that drives behavior. And so I'm doing a continuation of Richard's vision, uh, but connecting it to the mosquito. So for the last five years, we've been working very actively on bringing the mosquito um, into, the, into the realm of where it can be a great model organism uh, for studying the genetics of behavior. Yeah, it was hard. It was not, it was really, really difficult to take, to take almost a non-genetic model organism and make it, um, uh, make it feasible to do. But it was been fantastic because female mosquitoes, you know exactly what they're programmed to do. They are programmed to uh, emerge from the pupil state to the adult state uh, find a male to mate with and then find humans from which to obtain a blood meal. And so they're very focused and they behave really beautifully. So you, we understand exactly what they were born to do. And so it's very simple to observe them doing it. It was a little bit harder in flies to figure out when, when, a, when a fly, when Drosophila wakes up in the morning, what is it? driven to do. I think the mosquito is a little bit closer to its, its, uh, its behavior and it's really easy to, uh, to measure it in the, in the lab and, and manipulate it in the lab. And very topical because we're having, there's every summer there's this huge resurgence of mosquitoes that, are, that vex people and are a nuisance but that also are increasingly alarming because even in the U.S. they are carrying diseases that worry people. I think that the challenges I faced as a female scientist really began with the skepticism that my father and other relatives had that this was a, a meaningful pursuit. 
And so I pushed back really early against anybody questioning my motives to do it. And I think that those, those motive, that, that reluctance to have me be a scientist had nothing to do with uh, my gender, more to do with that people didn't think it was a good way to make a living. When I entered graduate school, I did start to get this, or even as an undergraduate, when I worked in labs at NYU, I got the feedback that my hair, at the time I dyed my hair really white blonde, and I had, and probably still have a an, kind of an extravagant love for fashion. And so I was told that someone like you is just never gonna succeed as a scientist because you're not serious because you dye your hair white blonde, and at the time it was really white blonde, and I. I uh, fancied myself kind of a punk and wore really extravagant clothes and so that was the feedback I was given is that you'll never be a scientist because you're not serious. It's the vision that still is sort of operating in Woods Hole that, that scientists have beards, they wear t-shirts um, and khakis and sandals and that's what scientists look like. And so um, I, that kind of a feedback didn't, it had the opposite, if those people were trying to discourage me, it had completely the opposite effect because it just made me wear more makeup, dye my hair even blonder, and be more extravagant because I just think that those old ideas about you have to be a bearded man in t-shirt and khakis, it's just archaic and, and it, you, you know, one approach to that would be to just don the uniform, be a woman with uh, kind of a drab look and uh, t-shirt and sandals and try to blend in but I think that that's hopeless you can't you can't you have to just be yourself so um, and I'm seeing that more and more I think that when I was here as a 16 year old the few women doing science I think were doing their best to blend in to be as gender neutral as possible and now you go to meetings and you see uh, women are just themselves they're feminine they wear high heels they wear dresses and too bad if it bothers people so I think I think slowly we're changing this stereotype that that scientists are are men are serious looking men so i think it's a it's a topic of it's a topic of discussion about how how uh, people make a life in science uh if they are married and have children i think a lot of the discussion centers around women in science i think that's kind of the wrong way to look at it. Uh, in most cases, the women have partners who participate in creating the child and rearing it. Um, so I, I like this new trend to not call it um, maternal care or maternal leave. It should be parental leave. There should be equal participation. We're all biologists. We realize that, that the creation of the child requires equal participation from the man and the woman. Um, and I think that uh, in past generations, the successful women chose not to have children. I think that there was really strong societal pressure early in mid 20th century that if you were married or if you had children that you were actively pushed out of science. And so it's really unfortunate that, um, I guess Marie Curie is a notable example of someone who was incredibly successful and had children. Um, but a lot of biologists who came up in the 50s, 60s and 70s ended up not having children. And I also am heartened to see that that's, it's an option now for women to have children and be married and it doesn't cut into your career. I think only in places where the institutions make it possible. And the, the ways to make it possible, the simple formula, you have to pay the women enough that they can afford babysitters and nannies and people to clean the house. You have to provide daycare, ideally at the institution where it's on site, where you don't have to drive 20 miles to pick up your child. If the child is sick, you could just go downstairs and take the child to your office rather than having to drive 20 miles to daycare. And the third part is uh, having a partner that understands that science is a, it's not a 40 hour a week profession, it's, it's a 24 hour a day profession. You could be, I could be called on at any time, day or night to deal with what's going on in my lab. And so I think having a, a, a spouse who understands the demands of the business is really important. I think science, originally I, I, I came into science under these false pretenses. I thought, oh, in science you can, first I saw science here is, it's different in, in, in an in a academic institution. This, this place gets very full in the summer and people play tennis and go to the beach. I think that there's, there's, there's less of that in New York City at those, like, we don't go to the beach. <laughs> 
play tennis um, during the day. So, but, but what I thought was like, if you're a scientist, you just get judged on your work and, and there's no politics involved at all, but that's completely wrong. So that I realized, once I got into uh, college and graduate school, I realized that science is a very socially constructed business. And so the connections are extremely important and the connections that have allowed me to progress through my career are very important. So the mentors who help write letters for you, the other people who connect you to reagents and people are really important. And I, I work really hard on making a big social network of, of people who are more senior than I am. And then also increasingly, as I, I'm almost 50, I'm a tenured professor, so I work really hard on identifying uh, young people, both men and women, but I, I do concentrate a lot on women, identifying the women who have, I see have the hunger in them to do this and try to pull them up um, and try to make things happen for them uh, at all levels, because things don't happen. Being a great scientist is a really important component of it, but there are strings that can be pulled to make people progress more quickly than they normally would, so I put a lot of energy into that, you know, seeing someone who maybe isn't getting the recognition they should be and try to help them connected, get them connected to, to, to funding agencies, get them connected to the right editors, get them connected so they progress. MBL is this big uh, epicenter where people come and so uh, there's a lot of great people who come here and so I've met many young women uh, here through MBL, uh, people who've been students in the courses that I've taught or uh, I was here for the grass labs this summer, so I met some, some of the young grass fellows who I definitely have my eye on. I figure like, well, I will try to help her get connected to something that will help accelerate her career. So yeah, MBL is an incredible uh, place to connect the social network that gets, it, it's active, it's most active in the summer, but then it sort of explodes outward um, during the other times of the year. So um, what's, what's amazing about MBL is that they make it possible for science at every level because they provide housing for people. And if you come here with children or pets, they find a way to accommodate that. So there are specific arrangements where you can. I came here a few summers where it was not only me and my daughter, but also her nieces and her grandparents. They somehow found a cabin that could accommodate all of us and that was where it was permitted to to bring a dog because it's very expensive and painful to leave a pet behind to be taken care of for a month. So, so I think for the housing infrastructure and logistics, they're, they really understand that if you're going to come here and work, that they need to make it possible for the whole family unit to come. And they also have invested heavily in child care. So they have infant care, toddler care, and they have uh, for school aged children these great clubs which are incredibly affordable with a very high quality of care that really makes full use of the environment. They don't just lock the kids into a room all day to color, they take them outside and get them, they kind of train them as scientists from the toddler stage up, they get them involved in science. I think it's the best possible way to get families to come here and get, get women scientists and male scientists with families to be able to come here. Yeah, the courses are really fantastic. I think that the um, uh, the courses have done more to produce generations of top scientists than I think almost anything else in the country. I'm always I'm amazed when I hear that the NIH has turned down funding intermittently. The courses aren't funded, but you just have to look at the the list of people those courses have produced, and it's really phenomenal. And it's true they have an incredible relationship with the vendors who loan equipment, and so you see equipment here that isn't available for sale yet that's being tested on the students for the first time. So the students have this incredible privilege of seeing not only great cutting edge equipment, but also a constant stream of world class scientists who stick around and hang out and talk to them and uh, listen to what they're doing. It's, it's really, uh, I've sent a few of my graduate students up here and they've all benefited enormously from the experience. I think that, uh, so Woods Hole and MBL, um, it's constantly changing, but it always stays the same. I think because the Captain Kid has been here for, it feels like a hundred years, it's always the same people <laughs> coming here every year. So it does, it does feel like a community. I think a lot of scientists who came here in the 70s have now retired here and are year-rounders. So that's an incredible sense of continuity and 
in the community. I think that the big change which under Joan Ruderman's leadership has really manifested itself is that I think in order to stay relevant in this century, there's this increasing distancing from marine, the, the word marine in, in MBL, that it really has become a biomedical, it's become a powerhouse of training people in biomedical science and that's, that, that's the big, big difference. When I came here in the 80s, people didn't work with insects or rodents or uh, things like zebrafish. It was the, the, the experimental organisms were anything you could fish out of the water surrounding the labs and that is, um, there's still great work being done on, on squid of course and I'm aware of the environmental program but I think the courses, the vast majority of the courses don't use animals that are fished out of the water. So that's I think the biggest, biggest change over the last 30 years.